Hey, Deserving Listeners, I thought I would answer some patron emails. This first email is from Anonymous Upper Tier Patron. They write, Can you please talk about trauma bonding? I've recently heard a few influential people on YouTube using the term trauma bonding in an incorrect manner. They all use it in the context of bonding with someone that has been through similar traumatic experiences. End of email. Right. So the term trauma bonding... Uh, is uh, related to abuse when you bond with your abuser. And I can see why people would uh, misuse it or even just invent a new term. Not a lot of people, even in intimate partner violence circles, necessarily use the term trauma bonding very often. So it's either that they are misunderstanding the term or they've just invented a new phrase and they're, you know, it just coincides with a term in in with partner violence or in, um, you know, abuse circles. So, you know, other terms that people will abuse, like when they say codependency, that will bother me because that's clearly not something that they came up with on their own, but it's possible, you know, that people just came up with tra trauma bonding on their own and they're using it to refer to, as you say, bonding over going through similar traumas. And I, I don't know if that really bothers me that much in my pedanticness. But yeah, let's talk about trauma bonding. So like I said, it's when victims bond with the perpetrator, essentially. It's like S Stockholm Syndrome. There are, are a lot of relationship types that this will be applied to in the literature, obviously intimate partner violence, domestic violence, relationships, ro romantic relationships, but also cults or hostage situations at work with an abusive boss, sex trafficking, you know, pimp sort of situations, and even a parent-child relationship. It's a part of the abuse cycle. When the abuse happens, there's usually a cycle that will, uh, you know, the pendulum will swing from abuse to reward to abuse to reward. And often it's done in an unpredictable manner by the abuser. And this can cause the victim to feel like they're always walking on eggshells, essentially. And, and this breaks the victim down. It cuts them off from the self and they base the victim will define themselves to the eyes of the abuser. And um, these are my conceptualizations, and we don't really know exactly why people will bond, because it seems so counterintuitive, right, that you would bond with your abuser. It seems like they would be the last person you, you would want to bond with. And, and it's not a fake bond either. The tr you know, trauma bonding, Stockholm Syndrome, it's real. Like you hook up the victim to a lie detector test, and they absolutely love and prefer their abuser. This doesn't always happen in abusive relationships, obviously, but it can, and particularly if it's ongoing, and particularly if the person c comes from an abusive background themselves, meaning that the victim has been victimized before. Because you know, if you're victimized by your parents and you have all these schemas in mind and, and working models of self and other that involve abuse and love being intertwined, then as an adult, if you're in an intimate partner violence relationships, it, it, relationship, it wouldn't be that much of a stretch to consider the abuse to be just a part of love or even be evidence of love. I mean, some, some abusers, some, some victims, chronic victims, will have a heuristic around abuse equaling love because they're used to it, but also it indicates effort, you know, when, and sometimes people who are chronic victims will uh, find that when they meet someone romantically who isn't an abuser, they will become very bored or they won't really be in love or they won't feel like they're being loved because, um, and, and I know some of you might be able to relate to this because I've talked with a lot of people about this uh, phenomenon, which is that when an abuser, when you're a victim and you're being abused, of course it is terrible and, uh, you know, just criminal and awful and traumatic in so many ways. But it also is contact with another human being. Someone is putting effort into you. They are paying attention to you. They are trying to reach out to you in an extremely traumatic, violent, emotionally violent way. But it's still contact. And if you're not getting a lot of contact, it, sometimes you'd rather have that contact than be completely isolated or uh, neglected, right? So uh, my conceptualization is as to why trauma bonding occurs is that we need attachments, obviously, because, you know, we talk about this all the time. And often victims are isolated due to the abuse cycle and the abuse, um, the abuser's way of isolating the victim. And the abuser might be the only source of love and attachment. And so 
will just, you know, it's like, okay, I can either have no one in my life or I can have at least one attachment. Yeah, that attachment happens to be the person abusing me and isolating me from everyone, but at least I have someone that I can talk to and someone I can love. Also, it's easier just to give in when you're a victim. You are in an impossible situation. If you decide to hold on to yourself and push back, then you'll be abused even more. So it's better to be abused half as much while putting yourself on the back burner and falling in love with your abuser and convincing yourself that the abuser is good and wise. Because, you know, and children will do this too. And uh, uh, when they are being abused by their parents, they often will convince themselves that the abuser, that their parent is good and that themselves must be, must be the bad one because they need to believe that the parents are good people because they need to believe that their parents are wise and able to protect them. The other conceptualization I have is the self, the victim will say, you know, why am I being nice to this person? Because you need to be nice to the abuser. And that's one of the things, if you've never been in an abusive relationship, then this is one of those things that it's hard to really know unless you're in it. And I know this personally, I, I've also worked with a lot of victims and one of the most weirdest, one of the weirdest aspects of being a victim in, a, in an abusive relationship is you'll be nicest to your abuser. You'll be really uh, careful about what you say to them and you'll laugh at all their jokes and you'll smile when they enter the room. It'll be all kind of fakey smile. But again, it's easier if it's not fake because then it comes off as more authentic and then you avoid being abused. But yeah, when you're a victim, you just fall into this uh, routine of survival. You know, it, it's like if you in another survival situation where food is very scarce and you see someone a block ahead drop a can of food, you're going to notice it and you're going to run after it and you're going to try to get it. Well, the same goes is when you are in a state of survival and you're hyper vigilant about making sure that your abuser is calm and likes you, then you can't exhibit or maybe even feel anything negative about that person. Another question that you ask yourself is, why am I being abused exactly? You know, I don't understand why this is happening. And one of the conclusions that victims will come to is, well, I must, I must deserve it. I, I must deserve it. Again, particularly if you come from a childhood with that. Another conceptualization I have is that we confuse our abusers as parents because we feel like children in the presence of the abuser because the abuser is so powerful. And so we will utilize a template from our childhood of, oh, this, this person must be our parent, essentially, and then we end up um, bonding to them. It's instinctual, essentially. And the last conceptualization is that we confuse intense feelings with love. We've talked about this before. When you're being abused, you have very intense feelings of fear and, and pain. And we have found through research that when you have intense feelings, it tends to be confused or it tends to intensify any kind of attraction or bond you have with the people around you, even if those people are the ones that are giving you the intense negative feelings. And this is particularly bad for women because women are often taught that men, strong men, again, particularly if you come from a culture or a family where this was taught in a toxic masculine way, that women are taught that, and men are taught this too, that strong men, good men are manly and protective and macho and don't have emotions and are assertive and, and will, um, you know, uh, knock you around when you're stepping out of line or that kind of thing. And so when you're having an intense feeling, uh, you know, like, let me give two examples. So you're out to dinner with your toxic masculine male uh, husband and you're at a table and someone nearby is making too much noise and, and you're both getting annoyed. And your husband stands up and says, you know, to the other table and says, Hey, be quiet or I'm going to knock your teeth out. And the other table, they're quiet. They're, they're scared. They're like, oh, that guy is big. He's going to knock our teeth out. And then he sits down 
Well, if you're a woman that comes from a culture where that's highly valued and a family where that's highly valued, then you're going to say, oh, you know, he, he's a sexy man. He just was very manly and told those people what's what. And I am extremely sexually attracted to him right now, or at the very least, I really want to bond with him. And I can give a lot of examples of this. This, even if you're in a non-toxic masculine bubble, there's still a lot of this in our culture. I mean, just watch the Furious, Fast and Furious movies. You don't have to look that far. Um, but even, even you know, like I was watching Friends the other day, and there's no, you know, like Ross was always the the beta, right? And uh, Joey was more the uh, alpha, I guess. Anyway, point is, is that we still have a lot of this. So let me give another example. You're at dinner at a restaurant and your husband is getting angry at you for, I don't know, nagging him, so to speak, as he calls it. And then he puts you in your place and he says, hey, if you don't shut up on a moment, I'm gonna knock your teeth out. Well, if you're used to seeing that behavior as a good thing, then you will, you can potentially confuse that. You're like, oh my God, he's going to knock my teeth out. Oh, but I equate mas masculinity and toxic masculinity and machoism with something that I'm attracted to. So am I attracted to him as he's telling me he's going to knock my teeth out or am I repulsed? And of course it's both. And the self, if they're, trapped the victim, then they will choose to consciously be aware of the bond and they will submerge the pain that they're feeling. So this all leads to complete dependence on the abuser. It can lead to rationalizing the abusive behavior or even defending the abuser. And there are famous cases of victims jumping in front of, uh, you know, a, a gun, jumping in front of bullets for their abuser. And it's a known phenomenon. Humans, we're, we're not logical creatures. We are emotional creatures. We're irrational creatures. Our main organ of, um, in our body that does all our thinking is a massive fatty goo between our ears. And so it's very, um, it's, it should be understandable that we're not always logical. Anyway, let's go on to another email. All right, this next email is from anonymous patron in Memphis. He writes, I've been reading Extraordinary Relationships by R Roberta Gilbert, and I have some questions. Just chiming in here, I recommend a book called Extraordinary Relationships by Roberta Gilbert. You can find it on my website under book recommendations. Uh, there's probably a lot of used copies around for pretty cheap. It basically helps. It's, it's a self-help book but pretty technical as well regarding differentiation and Boinian theory. I actually assign it to my students as a uh, primer on differentiation and Boinian theory. It reads real fast. So an honest patron in Memphis read that book. One of, my, one of the main ways the book mentions one can become more differentiated is by going back to the family of origin and healing the relationships there. My psychologist has explicitly told me to... to has explicitly told me not to stay at my father's house for an extended period of time and to avoid my mother at all costs. The book can't be asserting that if someone is undifferentiated in their current relationships, they should return to a family of origin that sexually, physically, and emotionally abused them, can it? How can one become more differentiated without returning to the family that created the pattern of undifferentiation? I specifically am struggling with fusion and enmeshment in my romantic relationships, and when the interactions become too intense, the other person tends to shut down and distance. This is all related to the fact that I have preoccupied attachment style, and I tend to gravitate towards people with an avoidant attachment style. Any insight or tips would be appreciated. End of email. Yeah, so first off, trust your psychologist. They know you best, and they'll you know maybe have them read the book too, so you can kind of talk about it together. And there are many ways to differentiate. For example, when your parents have passed away, how are you supposed to work on differentiation? Well, there are many ways. One, detriangulation in your current relationships, self-awareness, mindfulness, therapy, assertiveness. Assertiveness is a big part of differentiation, being able to assert your needs in the moment without being accusatory or aggressive or hostile while listening to someone else. That's very important. Compassion through accurate conceptualization of other people is also a differentiated thing. You'll hear me and Bob often talk about 
how we gain true compassion by seeing people accurately, seeing people in a way that takes into account their history and their traumas. And when, you know, differentiation is required in order to do that. And the more you do that, the more differentiated you become. Because you, when you're interacting with someone, you know, like for you, anonymous patron, you're saying you're preoccupied and you gravitate towards people who are avoidant, which is fine. But when you have conflict with them, you might conceptualize them incorrectly because you're not giving them the benefit of the doubt. And then your preoccupation kicks in because you're scared because you're interpreting their, you know, distance or quietness as a sign that they're going to abandon you when in fact they're just being quiet or something. And so accurate conceptualization is also a part of differentiation. Knowing your goals, having clear goals in your life, knowing the purpose of your life, having a sense of self, being in connection with the self is one of the core elements of differentiation. You know, you read in the book the the basic self versus the pseudo self, which is essentially the same concept that I'm talking about in terms of connection with the self. So uh, there's a lot of things that one can do to differentiate. And you can't, in my mind, usually differentiate by just going back home. So there's always going to be other things involved anyway. Having said that, I've worked with clients on differentiation and have helped them and uh, coached them, so to speak, as they return home to abusive parents. Now, you, you said that you can't stay in your father's house for an extended period of time and that you should avoid your mother at all costs. So again, your psychologist knows best and you know best, but if I heard that from a client, I would explore it a little bit. I would say, okay, well, let's talk about your dad. It sounds like there's less threat from your dad. And maybe it's just talking on the phone for a couple hours. Because you don't have to go home to differentiate. It's just a matter of contact with them. Or writing him a letter and, and asking him to write a letter back or something. And with the mom, avoiding the mother at all costs, okay, if contacting her will create a lot of problems for you. But it, one of the beauties of Bowenian technique is that, and again, talk with your psychologist about this. You and your psychologist know best. But sometimes to... It, once you have the resources and enough differentiation yourself and enough support yourself, and you can really plan and strategize, you can actually con. I've worked with clients who will contact their abusive parents or whoever abused them in a very controlled manner, very deliberate baby step manner, and we'll see differentiation results. Because imagine, anonymous patient, if you could say over the next five to 10 years, Ha take baby steps towards contacting your mom. It's not going to change your mom. Your mom's probably still going to be the same, whatever it was that she is, how, how, you know, however she is. But your relationship could change the way you con. You know, give this kind of extreme example. Let's say your mom is totally physically and emotionally abusive and has been your entire life. And whenever you contact her, she finds a way into your life. And she, you know, maybe she's nice for a little bit, but then boom, she hits you with a massive a screed of emotional abuse or something. And you have learned repetitively through, you know, re repetition that you just can't communicate with your mom at all. Well, imagine with support and with a lot of intention, you reach out to her and you start to kind of build up that relationship a little bit. And you say, look, mom, I want to have a relationship with you, but I don't, I'm worried that things are going to become conflictual, conflictual. So I just want to have it be kind of under a controlled circumstance, because um, I don't want to be completely cut off from you. Again, talk with your psychologist about this. But you contact her and you're like, okay, she's being nice now, but I know she's going to be emotionally abusive in the future. And so maybe a, you talk on the phone every Sunday night for half an hour or something. And then a few months in, boom, she does something. You know, she calls you all week long, accusing you of something. Well, then that's one of the magic moments of of opportunity to differentiate. Because in the past, your response might have been to either run away or to try to please her or something that would be fusion based. But what if through therapy and through a lot of intention, you were able to stand up to her at least half the time? That's It's, hard, it's impossible to be able to uh, be differentiated under such circumstances the entire time. But say half time or even a quarter of the time, you're able to push back and say, mom, you know, I don't appreciate this. 
And when you're ready to talk, I, I'm, I'm willing to talk, but I, I don't want to talk when you're, when you're, I'm not going to respond to, to that kind of talk anymore. You know, I, I did when I was younger, but I'm not going to do that anymore. I, st- I still love you, mom. I still want to have a relationship with you. I, I'm guessing something's coming up for you that I don't understand, but I, I know that I don't deserve this kind of behavior. So imagine if you could do that a quarter of the time. And this is what Bowen was talking about. And this is the magic of Bowenian family of origin and Framo family of origin style therapy. Framo is another theorist uh, like Bowen, family of origin theorist. And th- it's strange, you know, because you think, well, just being able to be assertive and, and because the key is you're to be differentiated, you have to be in contact with people while standing your ground, while also having some compassion for them, but not being overly pleasing. It's this balancing, you know, it's you're, you're in contact, but you're not losing the self in the process because the, you know, there, for a lot of people, there are two alternatives. I either lose the self and please, or I run away and I cut myself off. But those, both of those, as you know, anonymous patron, after reading Extraordinary Relationships by Roberta uh, Gilbert, are just two forms of fusion, different sides of the coin. Uh, you know, true differentiation is, is assertiveness, being in contact. Now, that's a tall order when you're in the face of someone who's extremely abusive. And for some of my clients, they don't want to do that work. They're just like, nah, I think I'm done with my mom who's been abusive my whole life. And uh, I, I hear you that if I worked on that, but it just sounds so laborious and I, I've, I've burnt that bridge, I'm done, which is also fine. But the the magic of family of origin therapy is that when you manage to, so the way that I kind of see it is like, so imagine you do that to the mom and 25% of the time you're standing up to her while staying in contact. You're not yelling at her. You're not stooping to her level. You're not losing your cool. You're staying in contact, but you're not going to take that crap. And you have compassion, but you also have compassion for the self. And in that moment, the way that I see it, the way that I, conceptualize it is that neurologically your brain is changing from at one state to a different state, a, a, a semi-permanent state. And the, the more you do that to your mother, to the source of your fusion, the more your brain actually rewires itself towards a different way of thinking and being a different way of reacting. And then in future relationships, you know, as you're saying, you know, we generalize that, that fusion to our other, and you generalize differentiation to the other. So the next avoidant attachment style uh, person that you date, uh, you'll have a similar ability to be differentiated because neurologically you have changed. And the way that I see it is that any any time you practice this differentiation with any relationship, it will help to rewire the brain. But when you do it with your parents, it is accelerated. You don't have to do much differentiation work with your parents or your family of origin to get a lot of results. You could, can, in my head, I, I kind of see it as like a, like a 25 to one ratio, you know, for, for every one differentiated family of origin intentional moment you have with your parents, you would have to have 25 or, you know, 10 to 25 incidences with your peers or with your significant others. Uh, does that make sense to people? So you can do it with other relationships, but the idea is, and the findings, and this is what Bowen and Framo and family of origin work is all based on. It's like, when you go back to your parents, it's, they found it to be so much more long lasting and, and, and transformative to the personality, if that makes sense. But again, trust your psychologist, listen to them. All right, let's take a break. All right, we're back from the break. Let's do an old OPP, an old patron praise. These individuals have been patrons ever since May of 2018. They have stayed and remained as patrons, steadfast and loyal to the podcast ever since. We got Lindsay from Colorado. We got Kyla from South St. Paul, Minnesota. That's interesting. So there's a there's a St. Paul and a South St. Paul. We have Inside the Boards from Lorraine, Ohio. We got John from Stockholm, Sweden. Interesting. I was just talking about Stockholm Syndrome. We got Rachel from Bradenton, Florida. We got 
Liesel from ZA, Newcastle ZA. What is ZA? ZA country code. ZA country code. South Africa. South Africa? ZA? <laughs> Why is it ZA? Uh, Why isn't it SA? Anyway. Okay, so <laughs> we have that. Liesel from South Africa. We got Aaron from Milwaukee, Oregon. I bet you didn't know there was a Milwaukee, Oregon. We got Tina from Seattle. Good old Seattle. We got Dennis from Fairfield, Connecticut. We got Frida from God knows where. We got Toe from Sweden. I think I, I know Toe. I feel like I've interacted with Toe. We got Alina from Medford, Massachusetts. So thank you all for being patrons Oh, so long. And also, just a little reminder, if you aren't yet a, an, an annual patron, please do so now Do so now, because it really helps us out. And you get a discount. All right, this next email is from patron Thor from Denmark. He writes, how do you go about breaking it to a client if you believe they qualify for a DSM diagnosis or fit a clinical label? Do you have, an, do you have to approach it differently or in a very specific way if the client lacks insight or if the diagnosis has a lot of stigma attached to it, like narcissistic personality disorder or psychopathy end of email yeah absolutely i will always tell my clients what i believe their diagnosis is but it's not a central feature of therapy usually i will work with clients for years and maybe we only talk about their dsm label once out of hundreds of, of sessions so it's not usually a focus but i have with some clients made it a major part of the focus. For example, with avoidant attachment style, we might talk about it every single session. I might even say, how's your avoidant attachment style going? And they'll be like, well, I avoid it in this way. I've been doing this sort of thing. So sometimes it's centered around it. Sometimes it's completely not. But if there's stigma attached to it, I will either tell them a different label because the thing about the DSM is that people forget, I think, even clinicians, is that it's written by humans. It's not like decreed upon on high. It's not like Freud descends from the heavens and gives us this book. It's just, it's just a book written by some authors. And there are other diagnostic manuals, by the way. It's not the only diagnostic manual. It just happens to be the one that is considered to be the uh, manual that we use when we're diagnosing for official purposes. But as a clinician, since I don't use insurance anymore, I used to use insurance a lot, but I don't anymore. I don't even need to use the DSM. I could use my own system. I could use a different diagnostic manual and that'd be okay. I don't need to use the DSM. So just because the DSM calls it, you know, narcissistic personality disorder or borderline personality disorder, doesn't mean I need to call it borderline personality disorder. I only use that language because in order to talk to y'all and clinicians, and I know many of you are clinicians, I need to use the label so that we all understand what we're talking about. But you'll hear me say things like uh, that I'll base it on a schema, for example, abandonment schema or entitlement schema. Or you'll hear me use terms like relationally traumatized, which I find to be more accurate label than borderline. So for some people, if, if I'm not sure how they're going to react, then I'll probably use these other labels first, but often eventually I'll just tell people, I just, I, I don't, if I were a client, I would want someone to tell me it's, it's, a, you know, I know what it's like to be a client one, but I also know what it's like to be a patient with a physician and feel like I'm kind of in the dark and I, I want to know what's going on. It's my body, right? I don't want the physician to dance around and like worry about what, label it is or you know sometimes I'll, I'll i i went to a ear nose and throat person i think anyway they were they put a scope into my into my throat and they were like yeah we see some things in there it, you know looks benign da 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 and they're they didn't use the word benign but they kind of danced around it and i was like are you talking about cancer and she's like yeah uh, but she wouldn't use the term because i think she learned from experience or something that she doesn't want to freak people out, but uh, yeah, I, uh, cancer freaks me out, but I, I want to know what's in your head doctor so that I know what my body is doing. So I know what to do with my body so I can take care of myself. And the same goes with my clients. I want them to know what's in my head. I want them to know what label is knocking around in there. Now I might say, so 
you suffer from narcissistic personality disorder, but do not Google it because the internet doesn't know what they're talking about. 99.9% .9 of what's on the internet, literally, because I've actually, <laughs> I did a survey, you know, just Google stuff and like, they might get some of the symptoms right, but the, the tone of it is all off. They have no idea what they're talking about. And I will tell them, just don't go to the internet because the internet has no idea what they're talking about. Listen to me and I will tell you what narcissistic personality disorder, I will tell you what borderline is. I will tell you what psychopathy is, that, that kind of thing. And if I believe their relationship is strong enough and I believe that their ego is strong enough, then yeah, I'll absolutely tell them. And personally, I think it's unethical not to tell them. And I think it is also a cop-out not, not to tell them. I feel like a lot of clinicians are afraid to talk about it or frank, they frankly don't understand the concept very well. And they're afraid that if they start talking about it, the client will push back and the clinician won't know how to justify themselves. And so uh, there's a lot of clinicians that will say things like, well, you know, they don't need to know. Or if I tell them, it'll harm them. And I'm like, if you tell them what is wrong with them, it will harm them. How can that be true? <laughs> like, I mean, there are some extreme cases, like someone's delusional and they're prone to thought problems. But uh, if you can't explain something to them in a way that at the very least it's neutral for them, then you either don't understand the concept or you actually have a distortion of the concept. You know, like if, I could, there are people who would say, oh my God, that per she's so borderline, you know, she's so annoying and she's so da-da. Yeah. And that person would be like, well, I'd never tell her a borderline. Be well, it's because the clinician sees borderline as a negative thing, as a, as a, uh, an insult to someone's personality when it isn't. It's just a normal reaction to abandonment and to abuse. So, um, yeah. So whenever I come across clinicians... So, I will find some clinicians that will be like this, that will be like, well, I would never tell. And and if they're under me, meaning they're a, a trainee or a supervisee of mine, then I say, well, let's change that and let's try to educate you so that you have a good enough grasp on the concepts such that you can actually deliver it in a way that will be compassionate and won't harm the client because the, the client deserves to know. And there are a lot of clients out there who have been diagnosed by their mental health clinician, and the client doesn't even know what they were diagnosed with, because it's not a requirement of therapy that the, that the client understand. But can you imagine that? Can you imagine going to a physician, and you're like, yeah, something's wrong with my stomach, and then they, they secretly diagnose you, and then they give you a pill, and you're like, what's this for? And they're like, well, just take it, you know, just take the pill. And you're like, well, what's wrong with my stomach? They're like, oh, don't worry about that, just take the pill. Can you imagine that? So why in therapy are there clients who don't know what they're being diagnosed with? <laughs> I mean, it's like, yikes. All right, this next question is from patron Josh from Oklahoma. He says, is there a correlation between avoidant attachment styles uh, and cluster B personality types? Uh, yeah, uh, first off, it's avoidant attachment style. There's only one of them. And the uh, minor association correlation is with narcissism. And I talk about that in both the attachment deep dive and the narcissistic deep dive. Patron Joanne from Florida wrote in and said, when do I move on from having a relationship with my parents? My parents have disowned me for being trans. They have never asked me about my experience as a trans woman. I have tried writing them a letter to no avail. I am about ready to move on. Honestly, I hate my parents at this point. If you have any advice for someone in a situation like this, that'd be great. End of email. Well, I'm really sorry, Joanne, that you're going through this. It's completely unfair. And also, it's completely unfair that your parents are like that. I mean, your parents weren't born transphobic. Not that it excuses their behavior, but they are likely a product of their echo chamber and brainwashing that tells them that binary is great and trans is wrong or sinful or something. And so it's a tragedy all the way around. You're the main victim of, the, of that oppression and ridiculousness and illogical uh, teachings. But, but anyway, so I'm really sorry you're going through that. And I don't know how to answer your question you know, because it's too complex. It, it's, and there's no way to win. You know, you're, you're stuck, you're ambivalent. You're like, I want to move on, but I also don't want to move on. I hate them, but I want them to understand me. i I want a connection with my parents. I want them to accept me. And all that is real. And most people, when they go through this process and they run into parents like yours, it's a lifelong thing. 
and there's ups and downs and there are periods of time where you don't talk to them and there are periods of time when maybe you do, maybe there's reconciliation. Um, but the thing is, is that none of it is your fault and you're absolutely, and so there are a few things that I tell people who ask me this, because I get this question a lot, actually, not just about trans people, but about estrangement from parents. And um, I, I will say the following. One is you're, you're totally, in my book, with, for what it's worth, able and justified in cutting them off. You're, you're absolutely justified. And I find a lot of adult children in situations like this will feel like they're being disloyal or something wrong with them by just giving up and moving on with their life. And, and I say, no, no. Uh, so do what you got to do, do what you want to do, especially in a situation like this. I mean, they've cut you off. So giving up on them is totally an option and don't feel guilty. It, they did this to themselves. It's a, it's a tragedy of society that they are a victim of and so are you. So that's one thing. The other thing I'll say is that there's a lot of grief, obviously. There's a lot of pain, a lot of hurt, a lot of anger. And you're going to have a lot of feelings and longing. You might have a lot of longing of, of reaching out, and that might be very ambivalent for you because why would you long for, for them because they're being so terrible? So uh, those feelings have to be felt and have to be experienced when your body wants to experience them. And that might happen for the rest of your life. And you might be for the rest of your life or or for as long as they're alive, you might be having this question rattling around in your head. When do I move on? Do I give up? Should I reach out? Screw them. I hate them, but I want them to accept me. You know, this might happen for the rest of your life. There's just no way around it. Now it might not, you might be able to move on and, or they might come around but there's a chance that this will go on for the rest of your life and there's no way to put it away. Our, our connection with our parents is just too innate. It's just too primal. We can't just will that away. So there's that. The other thing I'll, I'll say is that a lot of parents in situations like this have come around. And so if you have the will and the capacity and the strength and the support and the desire, then occasional reaching out to them might actually turn them around. For a lot of parents and for a lot of people who are brainwashed as your parents are, the uh, contact with the enemy always dispels the silly notions. So the more contact they have with you as a trans woman, and maybe even other trans people, either in person or watching a television show or something, you know, fictional television or a documentary, maybe the more contact they have with that of, you know, that of which is feared, the less they will be afraid of it. It's as an analogy in the eighties, when I was a kid, 10 years old, there was this effort by liberal Seattleites to uh, humanize Russians and Soviets because we grew up in a time when the Soviets and the Russians were the evil empire. They were like Hitler and the Nazis to us. They had missiles pointed at us. And it was known that Seattle would be one of the very first things hit. We have naval bases and air force bases and army bases and marine bases, like all, all, all around Seattle. And the missiles would reach Seattle very quickly because we're closer um, in terms of... so. There was all this talk about like if we get attacked by nuclear uh, weapons, that Seattle might be the first to go. And and I remember kind of taking some pleasure in that or some comfort in that, I should say, that I wouldn't know until it, it was over, right? I wouldn't be like in Texas going like, oh well, Seattle's gone. Okay, well now Oklahoma's gone. Okay, here come the bombs over here. Anyway, and there was a lot of hatred and a lot of fear, uh, hatred based on fear of the Soviets and Russians. And, and I remember I was, I think in maybe like the seventh grade. And I remember sitting on the floor in the library in a big circle. And there was a Russian, a Russian woman, I believe, who was sitting there explaining to you recently emigrated from, from Russia, I think. And she was telling us about how wonderful the Soviet Union is. And she says the Soviet Union has problems, 
but the people there aren't the way that you've been brainwashed to think. We're not all out to get you. We don't want to hurt you. We're just like you. We're humans just like you. And that was a novel thing to me. I thought, because I'd been brainwashed by the Reagan administration and by propaganda and the newspapers and movies until, uh, you know, the, the evil, you know, the bad guy was always a Russian when I was growing up in movies, you know, with Steven Seagal or something. And I thought that they were evil. I thought they were out to kill me. I thought they were out to get me. And when I met someone, I remember a good portion of my hatred and my fear just washed away because I had contact with them. And so I don't know how you engineer that, Joanne, but if it's possible and you want to and you're up for it and they're not going to harm you in any significant way, then that's the campaign I would go on, um, honestly. Because I would like to think that your parents deep down want to love you, but their brainwashing is getting in the way. And so if I, I believe love will find a way, you know, like how in Jurassic Park, life will find a way. Well, I feel like love will find a way, but, you know, I, I'm just an optimistic person. But overall, I'm just sorry. And I apologize for our society for doing this to you. It's just so illogical. It's just so illogical. We humans are so stupid. Why would you disown a child for being trans? What is the diff? <laughs> What's the problem? It's not a problem. It's just being trans. Let it go. Okay, this next email, anonymous patron in Los Angeles writes, can you talk about how attachment injuries might affect a person with a secure attachment style? I think my childhood left me with a secure attachment style, but all my longer term romantic relationships in my 20s and 30s ended in me getting dumped. And I think this has had an effect on me attachment wise. End of email. Absolutely. Any attachment relationship can affect your future attachment style and your working models, right? Uh, that's why I emphasize that it's a style, you understand? It's not a, an enduring personality trait. It's a way of reacting to attachment threat. Our attachment style is a way, of, an habitual way, a learned way, uh, and sometimes a purposeful way of reacting to ab abandonment or um, lack of love, this kind of thing. And when you're raised well and you have a secure attachment style, meaning that you have a, a general working model of others and self that are good, you, you, you like yourself, you tend to trust other people, but you have some bad luck in your 20s and 30s and you have some abandonment that's going on in those romantic relationships and it's very hurtful, well, this starts to alter your working model, it starts to make you think, am I lovable? Can other people be trusted? And now you have a different attachment style or a modified attachment style, maybe one foot in security and one foot in preoccupied or whatever it is. Absolutely. All right. This next email, patron Allison from Tennessee writes, how can I stop being so paranoid? When I was young, I used to be unable to sleep after watching a scary Scooby-Doo episode. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Scooby-Doo actually is pretty scary if you consider it like four to seven-year-old children watching it all the time. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I watched it all the time as a kid. I hated Scrappy-Doo. Didn't everyone hate Scrappy-Doo? Anyway, um, I, I you know, the new Star Wars movie, Episode Nine. I equated the, you know, the new literal, the, the smallest little droid. Do you remember that new droid? Like, as if we needed more characters to be introduced. I mean, it was a pretty cool little droid, but it's like we already had... R2-D2, which is like a cute droid. It was, it, it coded as cute. And then you had BB-8, which is like even cuter, right? And then they went even cuter with this tiny little droid. And I'm like, he's the scrappy dude of the Star Wars franchise. Anyway. Um, unfortunately, I'm also very fascinated with true crime documentaries, and I often find them too compelling to avoid. This leads me to being completely, completely unable to sleep at night and then being overly paranoid for weeks that someone is going to break into the house and murder me. I'm 22 years old, and I definitely would like to be independent and live on my own sometime. But I just fear that I'll end up spending most of my time frozen in terror that someone is going to murder me. I know that this train of thought is pretty irrational, and murders are pretty rare, but I just can't help the paranoia. It's not even particularly that I fear death. I just fear being murdered. 
Do you have any tips on how I could overcome this? End of email. Well, there's a few things I'll say. One is that I don't know what's going on with you particularly. This is a kind of a clinical question, so obviously you would want to consult with a in-person clinician about this. But one way to overcome it is to stop watching so much gosh darn true crime documentary, <laughs> or, or Scooby-Doo for that matter. It isn't uncommon for people to watch horror movies or true crime or Scooby-Doo and to have trouble sleeping that night. And I hear you when you say it's very compelling and you really want to watch it. So you might want to look at that too. You seem to have the worst of both worlds. You are extremely compelled to watch it because it, for a lot, like my wife, for example, she cannot stand horror movies. It does cause nightmares for her. She can't sleep at night to the point where she doesn't even want to see like a, a trailer of a horror movie. And I'm not a horror movie fan either, I, but I don't mind watching them if I have to, or I, and I certainly don't mind watching a trailer. But for her, she avoids it. So it's a, you know, it's a win-win for her. She doesn't have to watch horror movies and she gets to sleep at night. But for you, it's a lose-lose. <laughs> you're, you're compelled to watch them and they make you paranoid. So you might want to look at why you are drawn to the flame in this way or why you have trouble with self-control. So that's one thing. The other thing is, is you're talking about an irrational fear that would benefit from CBT. You want to go to therapy and work on your automatic thoughts and your relaxation and your sleep and your thought patterns and your obsessiveness. It's possible that you have an obsessiveness trait and that's a, akin to, you know, OCD or with other anxiety disorders. And so there are things that you can do at therapy, talk therapy wise, that can actually help with that. The other thing to think about is self-sabotage. You know, you talk about how you want to move out, Allison, but it's almost like you're sabotaging yourself about moving out. Maybe there's something psychodynamic wise that you're playing out, some defense that's kicking in, that's stopping you from moving out. You're you, like, say you, you're afraid of being on your own or you're afraid of screwing up or you're afraid of disappointing your parents by moving out or something. And your psyche, your ego makes up this excuse to say, well, I know you're terrified of these true crime things, so I'm going to be compelled to watch them because I know it'll make you paranoid and thus it'll make you so scared you won't want to leave uh, your parents' house. So that's another possibility. But again, I, I would talk with a therapist. Okay, interesting. This next email is extremely related. We have patron Monica who wrote in and said, I'm a single mother with a five-year-old daughter, and I'm in the process of divorcing my husband. He was abusive to me, mostly emotionally, but sometimes physically. I don't hate him. He has been diagnosed with borderline personality disorder. The moment my husband moved out of the apartment, I started having a weird type of anxiety, mostly at night. I feel my whole body, I feel in my whole body that I am not safe, that someone will come into my house and kill me or I feel as if the world is going to end, or that the universe is, will just swallow me. I get triggered a lot by news about killers, people committing crime, people being addicted and not in control of themselves. I have been in therapy for over a year, but this anxiety doesn't seem to go away. Do you have any experience with this or suggestions that could help? End of email. Yeah, so for, you know, and this applies both to you, Allison, but for you, Monica, it, it sounds like generalized anxiety, or at least you're on the spectrum. And there's a, a lot of people who have a version of what you're talking about and will think of themselves as extremely rational. You know, imagine if you were afraid of, like, spiders were going to kill you in the middle of the night. Most people would be like, well, that's pretty irrational. But, uh, and like with what Allison was saying, it's like, it's not likely you're going to get murdered, but you still worry about it. So, uh, and you have a similar problem, Monica. Y you're saying you're, you're getting triggered by news about killers and people committing crime. People out there, stop watching this stuff. There's not a lot of rationality to watching this stuff. And now with like Nextdoor, the if you're familiar with the app, the website that compile, you know, everyone posts everything on there. It's like you know, we saw a suspicious character walking down the road. This can be very uh, damaging to your well-being if you, especially if you can't handle it. There's not, as I, you know, when COVID first began, I, people were asking, you know, how do we deal with this fear? And my, the model I developed back then was the following, that you, you're feeling a feeling for a good reason. So for you, Monica, at night, you're feeling fear of being killed and, and of 
something really terrible happening. Okay, so your emotions are telling you to do something. What, what's it telling you to do? What's well, telling you that you're not safe? And there's a couple of things here. One is, is that you're at home by yourself with your five-year-old daughter and you feel vulnerable because, you know, at a certain level you are, right? If you don't have a security system or something. And you were abused by your husband who made you feel very unsafe. And uh, getting back to our conversation about trauma bonding, you might actually have felt like your husband, although he was abusive to you, at the very least, he was aggressive and would protect you from outside threats. I don't know that, but um, so you might actually feel yourself as a very weak person when you're actually not weak. You're actually potentially very strong, way stronger than he is in a lot of ways. And without him around, you might have this um, opposite feeling of like, you're the weak one when in fact you're the strong one. Anyway, so obviously there's a lot of therapy. You're in therapy and so you're working on it. But um, so as with Allison, you might want to reduce the news that you watch. And whenever I talk with people about this, they're just like, well, but I need to stay up to date on things. And, I'll, and then I'll say, so again, getting back to the model that I developed at the beginning of COVID was, we have this feeling of threat. All right, so what do we do about it? What can we do about it? So uh, maybe you sit down in the middle of the day and you're like, okay, occasionally, right now I'm not afraid so I can think straight, but sometimes I get afraid in the middle of the night about being murdered or something. Okay, so it's telling me that I'm at, I'm at risk at night. Okay, what can I do? Do I put an alarm system in? Do I put bars on the windows? Do I get a different lock on the, on the front door? Can I do that? Is that really what's going on for me? Do I put security lights in the outside of the house? You know, what, what do I need to do to make sure that I'm safe? Do I need to move to a different place? Is that even possible? What do I need to, to do to make myself more safe? Because that's why I'm afraid at night. I feel unsafe. So how do, I, how do I make myself more safe? So you do all the things you can to make yourself more safe. And when you're done with that process and you've done all that you can, all that's you know, reasonable, then any additional fear you have beyond that is irrational or at the very least unhelpful. And you have to categorize it as such. You need to target it. So what I see a lot of people do is they will read the news. They'll get afraid. They'll stare into the darkness in the middle of the night. And they won't be able to sleep at night. And it just happens over and over again. They just stay in that space instead of analyzing it and saying, okay, what's this fear telling me to do? Well, it's, it's telling me I'm safe. Okay, how do I get myself more safe? Okay, let's take action to be more safe. And then when you do that, some of your fear will go down because you're in control now. You're the one that is, a, a, this is what I do incidentally, by the way, like, I don't know if men are like this. I, I can imagine that it could be a man thing that it's not like I don't, I don't feel unsafe. And I, sometimes I do feel unsafe, but I will take action. You know, I, I'll figure, okay, let's put bars on the windows. Let's get a security system, you know, simply safe or whatever. Let's, um, let's think about security lights. Let's think about getting a bigger dog <laughs> who likes to bark at things. Let's, uh, you know, let's think about where they would come into, the, you know, cause that's another thing you think like, well, what, if you were to be broken into in your house, where would it be? And you just kind of problem solve that and think about how you can shore that up and you do something about it. And then any additional fear I have, I say, it's not helpful to, to feel that feeling. And so that's what, that's my process. What I don't do is watch the news. I do not. In fact, it's comical. Sometimes Stacy, my wife will be watching the news and I'll walk past the living room and I'll, it'll be the six o'clock news. And the, it's, it's a, it's just comical how, how repetitive they are about things. Men murdered in Renton, chopped up into five pieces. People want to know what happened. It's like, gee, you many crickets. Like, is that important to know? That because murders are happening all over the place, you know, violence is happening. You know, that's the one thing you're going to focus on. Fo all the things, all the in positive and negative things that happened in the Pacific Northwest region, and you're focused on some guy that was murdered and chopped up into five pieces and thrown in a garbage can. Like, it, why? <laughs> like, now I get it because violence, you know, if it bleeds, it leads, and people are paying attention to it, but I don't want to participate in that. I have analyzed myself enough and analyzed our society enough, you know, in the same way that when I go to 
uh, you know, cheesecake factory. All I want to do is eat cheesecake. <laughs> I just want to, I just, I just want to point at one of those cheesecakes and just, I like, send it over and play. I'm just gonna eat the whole thing. That's what I want to do, but I don't do it because I know I'll feel like crap out afterwards, and I know that's not a good way to eat. It's not healthy. So, uh, you know, I know my instincts are not always good. So when your instincts are to watch the news, even and, and as they're feeding all this stuff up on a platter for you, and you're sopping it up, do you stop and think, is this healthy for me? Just because it feels like I'm getting important information for my safety, is it actually helping you? Because it could be throwing off your perception of the world so far that you're literally lying awake at night, uh, worrying that the universe is going to swallow you up because that's the way it feels when the universe is not going to swallow you up and the chance of someone murdering you is extremely low. You are enormously more likely to get killed in a car accident. And when you drive your car, you don't worry about that at all, right? So why would you worry about someone murdering you in the middle of the night? It's possible, yes. <laughs> I've had these arguments with people. It's possible, yes. Someone could break into your house and murder you in the middle of the night. But you are more likely to be struck by lightning probably or be bitten by a shark and, and you don't lie awake worrying about being struck by lightning, right? Well, it, you, but you might be struck by lightning. You know, imagine if your spouse was like terrified they're going to get struck by lightning. You're like, well, it, you know, if you follow a couple guidelines, like when there's a storm, you just go inside, you're, you're probably okay. And they're like, well, but I might get struck by lightning. And you're like, yeah, but it's not likely, but I might get struck by lightning. And you're like, oh, it's, that's what this is like. So you have to understand that it's not helpful. It's possible. Yes, but it's not helpful to think about. So therapy, 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 <laughs> cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, habituation to the stimulus, uh, you know, in a graduated manner helping you to regulate your emotions, relaxation, all the things that are involved in, in anxiety management. There's a lot of people who are suffering from, uh, you know, generalized anxiety. Shall we say, you know, when you have full blown generalized anxiety, it's pretty obvious, but when you have like 50% generalized anxiety, you just look like a normal American. Cause I feel like normal Americans are, uh, the typical American is walking around with a, mild case of generalized anxiety and they think that they're being rational when they're not. And I say this because everyone deserves to be relaxed. <laughs> now, for some of us, we're not in a relaxed situation, but if your life is generally safe, you deserve to feel safe at night, you know? Now, again, maybe there's things you have to do to make yourself feel safe, put bars on windows or whatever. But uh, I feel like there's this notion out there that, well, the world is unsafe and the criminals are coming and people are going to get you. And if I don't stay on top of it and pay attention to the news and constantly think about this all the time, then the someone's going to get me. But take it from me. You know, I, I've actually looked into these kinds of crimes. If someone wants to break into your house and kill you, they're just going to do it. And there's not a lot you can do about it, even if you have a gun. <laughs> there's all these, there's all sorts of cases where people have guns and and it still doesn't help them, right? And I'm not saying that to say to be defeatist. I'm just saying all, it's sort of like, uh, there's, a, there's another American thing that people get into around health. That, it, okay, if I eat blueberries and if I, you know, work out all the time, then I won't die of cancer. And I'm like, well, you're going to die of something. Something's going to get you. And a lot of times it's genetic, you know, you talk to the experts, they're like, yeah, for sure. Eat healthy, live healthy. You know, your risk level goes down. But there are plenty of people. I, I remember there was this, um, there was this dad in, in, our, in my neighborhood, uh, a friend of mine's dad. And every morning he ran like 10 or 20 miles or something. I remember he was the, the most healthy dad in our group. He would run in the, you know, the pitch black in the morning every day before he went to work. He might have been, even been a doctor. I'm not sure. But he had a heart attack at f age 40 or something, like a really horrible heart attack. And it was shocking to everyone. It's like, but he was the most healthy one. And so I'm not saying don't exercise, but I'm saying that there's just a lot of things that are out of our control. And I feel like Americans believe that everything is under our control. And we just have to accept that we are a leaf in the cosmic wind of the universe. <laughs> we are being blown around. And 
when we, when I'll just talk for myself, when I accept that, when I sit back, cause I'm, you know, I'm, I'm just as guilty of, of all these kinds of fantasies of control as anyone else. But when I sit back and I just allow myself to blow and I just like, huh, like right now I'm, I'm really stressed out. Like long story short, I'm in this epic battle with the cable company, Comcast Xfinity. And, you know, my entire livelihood depends on the freaking internet. And so Xfinity and Comcast has me, you know, by the nuts. <laughs> like there's nothing I can do uh, if they decide they're going to make my life miserable. And so I'm completely powerless and it's really triggering to me. It's making it so that I can't even think straight. I'm just like dealing with this. I feel like I'm in the movie Brazil dealing with a, a bureaucracy that just is, you know, in inhuman bureaucracy. And it's so frustrating. And even as I talk about it right now, I'm getting activated, but I have to just remind myself that I am a leaf in the cosmic wind of the universe. <laughs> I am one with the force and the force is with me. I am one with the force and the force is with me. And yeah, well, that's a lot of soapboxing. But anyway, Monica, <laughs> a lot of people have that fear. Go to therapy, CBT, recover from your abusive husband, and, you know, maybe your anxiety. But, okay, okay, here's another thing. People out there, if you are like Monica, if you're like Allison, or you, you know, this conversation kind of appeals to you, the first step to getting better is admitting you have anxiety. And I find that some people have a really hard time admitting that they have anxiety because by implication, their, uh, their fears are overblown and they, they don't want to, they're hypervigilant about their fears. And so they don't want to give up on their fears because they feel like their hypervigilance is what's keeping them safe. And so people won't want to admit that they have anxiety because if they, if they have anxiety, then they have to take their hands off the wheel. That's, that's the way it feels like to them. But that's not the case. You can, st you can still be hypervigilant. You can still do all the things to make yourself safe, but you just won't feel about it the same way. And you'll be able to interpret your feelings better. So you have to admit, I suffer from anxiety. I have irrational, intrusive thoughts that are not helpful to me. I have a problem. And until you admit that, you're going to constantly be seduced by your own irrational thoughts, which is not a happy place to live. There's a, there's a road to recovery. And the first step is admitting you have a problem. All right, end of Soapbox. Anonymous patron writes in and says, is it possible to develop a personality disorder as a result of trauma experienced as a teenager or adult? I dated someone who I think may have had borderline personality disorder who seemed to have a pretty secure upbringing, but witnessed the death of his twin brother when he was 16. I know you don't have enough data to say whether this person actually has borderline, but could it, could it even be a possibility? End of email. Okay, so I think what you're asking is they were raised pretty well and they didn't have borderline personality disorder, but then when twin brother died at 16, that was a trauma that you know, prompted the person to develop borderline? Well, I don't know, and no one can know the answer to that question because borderline, you can't test it with a blood test. It's just a conceptualization based on observation and opinion. But I, I, I would be surprised if, if that was possible. Uh, you could become more symptomatic after the death of your twin brother. And it, it, it plenty of, so here's, and I don't think I emphasize this enough that genetics do play a pretty big role in development of your personality. Not that you were born with like a borderline gene, but you might be born with a, a very high sensitivity to relationships. And if everything's going well, then you don't develop borderline. But if, it, if things go a little bit bad, then you're much more prone to borderline. This is why siblings can be raised in the same situation and one can develop borderline and the other one could not because one had a more sensitivity to the abandonment or rejection or abuse or whatever and the other person just didn't they dispositionally or maybe developmentally didn't have that that personality trait so so there's that but the other thing is is if i met someone and they truly did have borderline a good case of it uh, as an adult and I heard that they had a twin brother that died when they were 16. And I also heard that they had a pretty good upbringing. 
I would be very suspicious of their pretty good upbringing. I, I would wonder about how this individual's, you know, the person with borderline, how their personality traits meshed with the way their parents raised them. So that's what I'll say about that. All right, let's keep going. I'm, I'm on a roll. Patron Louise from Lapland, Lapland, Sweden says, I'm interested in hearing your thoughts on the relationship between general intelligence and cluster B traits and personality. I understand that intelligence is quite difficult to operationalize given the different types of tests. But would passive aggressive traits be exacerbated in people with higher perceived intelligence? Would more intelligent people tend to have more inventive Machiavellian behaviors? Additionally, I'm interested in whether there is a relationship between intelligence and someone's awareness or ability to rationalize their personality traits during therapy. End of email. Well, Louise, this is a very good question, very smart question. And it's something that people don't often think about and something that I try to introduce with my trainees. I find it's, it's so weird Let me, <laughs> that you can graduate with a doctorate you know, in psychology or a master's degree in therapy and not once talk about intelligence through the now a psychologist degree you're going to talk about intelligence because they often one of the very first assessments you study are the IQ tests but but in terms of uh, clinically uh, how it could affect things and relationship wise how intelligence could affect things it's really weird because there's a wide variety of intelligence the ability to think quickly the ability to remember quickly the ability to uh, use words well, the ability to draw connections is, you know, measurable. And some people who have a IQ of 80, who, you know, well below average, have a really hard time making connections. They have a much harder time learning from their experience. They have a, their, their brain can work slower and, um, you know, than people with average or above average intelligence. And of course, these things are going to play a role in therapy, in relationships, in personality disorders, this sort of thing. But it's often not researched, which is interesting. And so I'm sure it is researched. I haven't looked up the research recently, but so you ask, would passive aggressive traits be exacerbated in people with higher perceived intelligence? It's a good question. I, I don't know the research. I don't think that would necessarily be true because you know passive aggression is when you are, uh, you know, you were prevented from being able to express your anger and so you express it in a hidden way as an adult. And intelligence, it might make it so that your hidden hostility is more, um, is more hidden, maybe. Uh, I could see that being true, but it's, it's hard to know. It depends on the level of your passive aggression, that sort of thing. Um, and as you say, it's difficult to operationalize intelligence given all the different aspects of intelligence. You know, someone... Let's say someone has below average IQ, but they also develop passive aggression and they learn over time through repetition how to be very passive aggressive, very hidden in their hostility such that they never are caught directly for their, for their hostility, even though they have low intelligence because they focused on it so much because it was a big part of their defensive structure. You ask another good question. What would more intelligent people tend to have more inventive Machiavellian behaviors? Again, I, I don't know the research on this. I'm, I'm guessing it might be hard to measure this because, you know, what's what's more inventive Machiavellian behavior mean? But yeah, I I, I could absolutely see this, and I, I saw this in people that I treated, uh, particularly in kids and teenagers, that were smarter. In fact, one of the things I saw in teens was there were kids who, uh, so a lot of the teens, I don't know, a good proportion of the teens that I treated in my early career were breaking a lot of rules because they, they didn't want to follow the rules. They wanted to hang out with their friends. They wanted to drink. They wanted to smoke pot. They wanted to shoplift makeup from the Rite Aid or something. And they wanted those things. But the kids who were smart were able to do all those things and still get away with it. They were able to know where the line was. You know, they would um, they would check in more with their parents, even though they didn't really want to, or they would make sure they were home by curfew, even though they were doing all these horrible things. Or they would, you know, they'd be drunk, but they'd come in the house right at you know midnight and go right to bed, knowing that if they go right to bed, they won't be noticed for being drunk. You know, there's a way that I 
thought older, that uh, smarter kids were able to get away with things. So it, it kind of points to that. And then the less intelligent kids were, were caught almost immediately. But that wasn't the only dimension that I think caused that difference. You know, there were other kinds of things that would cause, you know, when I observed a kid who was getting away with things, it wasn't intelligence always that was differentiating them. They might also be just, um, I don't know, just better able to talk their way out of things or they're less traumatized or they come from a privileged neighborhood where, they, I don't know. There's just a lot of different factors, but it's a good question. And you also ask... Additionally, I am interested in whether there is a relationship between intelligence and someone's awareness or the ability to rationalize their personality traits during therapy. And yeah, this is something that I think about a lot. This is something I think about a lot. That when I'm, because I'm, when I'm working with clients, my style is, you know, based on a lot of corrective experiences, but it also is based on a lot of self-awareness, meaning that I will try to download, as I was talking about earlier, my thoughts into the client's head so that they can use my conceptualization for to help them. So if they have preoccupied attachment, for example, you know, I will try to download my observations and conceptualizations into their head so that they can say, huh, am I being am I just being preoccupied attachment right now? Or what's going on? And sometimes I wonder if more intelligent people are better able to synthesize what I'm telling them. And I, I think that that's true. I think that there are people who are highly intelligent, clients that I've worked with, who I don't have to explain much to them and they get it. They're like, oh yeah, that makes total sense. And then, and they're often running with it. You know, I, I mention it one time in session five and then they come into session six and they've already figured out attachment theory <laughs> and they've put it all together and they're like, oh my God, it makes total sense. And they've drawn all these connections. And I think that is related to intelligence, but I don't know because I don't give intelligence tests to my clients. I only just I only just take a guess as to what I imagine their IQ would be because you know there are certain markers to IQ that you get to know as a therapist and as someone who's tested IQ a lot. So that's going to be my answer to that question. But Louise from Sweden, that's a great question. I wish people asked more questions about that. Um, not that you need to all send emails because I don't know if I have any more to say about it. <laughs> but anyway, um, I think I'll wrap it up there. I think I will do something else with the rest of my day. Maybe I'll record some videos for the old YouTubes and then maybe relax with the pod wife and try not to think about being murdered in the middle of the night. <laughs> <laughs> and everyone out there, please take care of yourself and take action on your emotions because you deserve it. You really, really do.